Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor, Deepak. Uh, incredible privilege to be here among such distinguished people. So I'm going to talk about uh, three things today. How yoga affects our brain. The second thing is, based on what we learn from what yoga does to the brain, can we use it as a tool to help people with serious psychological and neurological problems? And the third thing is, can we use yoga as a tool for social transformation? There's a new field called social neuroscience, which is the neuroscience of understanding how we interact with one another, the neuroscience of empathy, compassion, how we make judgments about each other. So I'm going to give you a hint of the different kinds of studies that are happening in these fields. So neuroplasticity is something that, it's a word that everyone here has heard of. Uh, we all know that children's brains and the infant brain is neuroplastic. That's how brains grow. But for a long time, scientists did not think that the adult brain was capable of change. They thought the adult brain was fixed, perhaps sometime in your early 20s, and then it kind of stayed fixed throughout your life till it started decaying and shrinking in late life. Uh, sometime uh, about uh, perhaps in the late, nine, uh, maybe 2000, and, uh, 2000, 2002, in that time frame, a lab just down the street here in San Diego, the University of California, San Diego, and the Salk Institute did some experiments uh, in rodent models. Of course, uh, we, we haven't learned how to make rats do yoga. Um, so this is the um, next best to a rodent Chopra center. So <laughs> they, com they compared rats that were put in sterile cages where they had you know, really not much to stimulate their environment, not much to stimulate themselves to uh, rats in, in, in a much more environmentally stimulating environment where they had a lot of toys, Disney World type toys. And then they looked at the patterns of brain growth, the patterns of what we call this neurogenesis, branching of the nerve cells, the size of the various centers in the brain, and they found there was roughly a 40% increase in what's called this neurogenesis. Now, this is not specific to yoga. Uh, this has been shown now with uh, a number of things, such as juggling. Any kind of activity that you use your brain for results in a specific experience-dependent change, which is called neuroplasticity. The second point uh, that I'm going to talk about, uh, you've heard about Superbrain, the book that uh, Deepak and Rudy wrote that became a uh, New York Times bestseller. At the same time, Another book has been slowly climbing the New York Times bestseller lists, and that is this book. This is the psychiatric Bible called DSM-5 that is now officially a certified New York Times bestseller. And the reason for that is the explosive growth of mental illness and the number of people diagnosed with psychiatric problems in this country. Something like 40 million people are taking medications uh, for psychiatric problems. And you can measure levels of psychiatric drugs in the public drinking supply in America. Okay? So next time you drink tap water, if you're feeling chilled out, that may be because there's Prozac in it. <laughs> uh, so the question here is, can we use yoga as a tool, not just to treat patients and help patients get them off medications, but maybe even to build resilience to prevent the occurrence of psychiatric disorders? The third field that I mentioned is the field of social neuroscience. Okay. So this is one of the classic pictures that has been used in a, in a social psychology experiment. So if you look at this particular um, uh, picture, you will see sort of uh, one smiley guy standing up front, right? And in the back, there are a bunch of faces of people that look like they're a little bit sad. So people are asked to rate the happiness of the person in the front on a scale of 0 to 10. And you get a wide range of responses. The reason is people who are much more individualistic tend to focus just on the person in the front and rate that person as being very happy. People who are much more interested in collective wellness tend to focus on the background, and they tend to give the person in the front much lower ratings. People have done this study and compared cultures. There are cultural differences. For example, Westerners rate this person as being more happy generally than Asians or Easterners. People have shown that if you take Westerners, 
while they're walking through Chinatown in New York, where they're seeing all kinds of symbols of you know, yin and yang and Tao and spiritual symbols, they start rating these faces like Easterners. And the same studies have been done before and after yoga, suggesting that before and after yoga, the same scenario, the same face, we, do, we make different judgments. So again, that shows you the potential of what yoga can do as far as you know, looking at uh, the collective wellness. So I'm going to start by showing you a couple of studies looking at yoga and the brain to look at neuroplasticity. Um, around the same time that Richie Davidson in Wisconsin was doing his classic EEG studies of meditation, a group at Harvard, Sarah Lazar and her colleagues, did this experiment where they compared a group of long-term meditators versus people who didn't meditate. And what they found was that there were several areas in the brain um, the areas that are shown lit up in one and two, mostly in the prefrontal areas. So these were areas that were found to be bigger in size in the experienced meditators. Uh, now this pre prefrontal area we all know is involved in executive decision, it's involved in working memory, it's involved a little bit in sort of your uh, emotion regulation, uh, making some judgments. And the second thing they found as shown on the graph by the side is that the age effect was there. In other words, the benefit of meditation appeared to be much stronger in older people, whereas in the non-meditators you saw age-related shrinkage in many parts of the brain, and this appeared to be lesser to the point where a 50-year-old meditator's brain was as similar to a 20-year-old non-meditator's brain. Now this was a cross-sectional study. You may say, well, you can't make cause and effect relationship. We'd have to do what is called as a prospective controlled clinical trial. And so they just did that. They followed that up with a prospective six-week trial, and they found very similar findings. In addition, what they found that six weeks of meditation in novice meditators could produce experience-dependent changes in various brain regions. So one of the brain regions they found that increased in size was the hippocampus, which is critically involved in learning and memory. And as many of the Alzheimer's people in the audience will tell you, it's also one of the first centers to start degenerating in Alzheimer's disease. The hippocampus is also involved in emotion regulation. People with severe clinical depression have much smaller hippocampi, as do people with severe PTSD. The other brain region that they saw uh, had uh, uh, significant effects of meditation was a, a very interesting region called the temporoparietal junction. So the temporoparietal junction is involved in perception. Again, I'm not saying that you have to take all the caveats from the previous talks. You know, as Deepak pointed out, these are just studies suggesting what the mind and the consciousness can do to the brain. It's not the reverse inference. We can't say that the brain is doing that. So the temporoparietal junction is involved in perception. And there's a couple of very cool studies that just came out. They used a device called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So if you, it's, it's a small device from outside the brain, you can stimulate certain regions of the cortex. And what they found was if you stimulated the right temporoparietal junction, you can alter someone's morality. They're much more likely to suggest that people should walk down a broken bridge, for example, including their family members and children. If you stimulate the left, parietal, uh, left temporoparietal junction, people actually report out-of-body experiences. So it's interesting that these regions appear to be the regions that meditation is showing some neuroplastic changes, and we still don't know fully what it means. We're still at the beginning stages of trying to figure all of this out. And this is the last imaging study I'm going to show you. This group asked a question, with MRI scans, can I diagnose who's a meditator and who's not a meditator. If I take a random person who I've never met before, just based on the person's brain scan, can I predict who has meditated and who has not meditated? And they found that they could do that with 94% accuracy using a combination of brain regions. So again, suggesting that there's something there, but we're again just scratching the surface. So I pointed out that the second area that I'm interested in is whether meditation and yoga could help people with serious psychiatric disorders, such as clinical depression, generalized anxiety disorder. So what we did was we conducted a systematic review of all the studies that have been done. There are roughly about 5,000 studies of yoga published in a medical database called PubMed. And out of those, we identified 124 good quality trials 
that had actually tested the utility of yoga for clinically diagnosed psychiatric conditions. And about 25 of those trials were of very, very high quality, what we would call randomized control trials, grade A. And the evidence suggested that for many cases of psychiatric disorders, yoga was just as good as the psychiatric medication. For depression, yoga was just as good as antidepressants. In schizophrenic patients, yoga, the addition of yoga to standard treatment resulted in much better outcomes. In ADHD patients, it was not as good as Ritalin, but still it improved attention. Sleep disorder patients improved sleep. So this is one very, very uh, interesting study. Amongst those studies we reviewed, 800 students. Now, this is not a study of psychiatric patients. This just shows what yoga can do to your mental and academic performance. A study of 800 students in eight public schools. They looked at yoga versus a control group, and the outcome was their performance in various exams, social studies, math, science, and they found that the outcomes were better in the yoga group than in the control group, even though when they started the trial, they were randomly assigned and they were all similar academically before the start of the trial. So suggesting that not only does yoga improve stress, it might improve anxieties, it might improve your attention, but this actually results in concrete measurable outcomes. So how does yoga do its uh, sort of magic in the brain? I think it affects multiple, multiple systems. We haven't even scratched the surface. We know that it produces the relaxation response. There's a recent study that suggests that it might reduce GABA levels. We think it might enhance neuroplasticity and neurogenesis in the brain. But there's a lot of other things that have yet to be measured. There's dozens and dozens of brain chemicals and I'm pretty sure that it affects almost every chemical that a classic antidepressant or antipsychotic affects in a much more sort of balanced way. So moving to the last few points that I'm going to make, the field of social neuroscience. So social neuroscience is sort of a very hot new topic, uh, just trying to understand how brain circuits are affected by the environment and how that in turn translates into everything from behavior to, to uh, our actions. I'm not saying the brain causes the actions, but still uh, there is a, a bilateral relationship. So this is one study, for example, that compared urban dwellers versus rural dwellers. And what they found was the stress response is different in people who live in cities versus people who live in sort of idyllic small towns. And the stress response in the city dwellers is much higher, and that can actually be reversed by yoga or meditation. This is a second study. You heard earlier in uh, Elisa's study that uh, inflammation was one of the outcomes that they measured in the study. I think there have been numerous studies suggesting that inflammation levels are reduced by meditation and yoga. And here's a very interesting finding. Inflammation doesn't just affect your risk for inflammatory diseases. Inflammation affects your brain and how you perceive and interact with others. So this study looked at how inflammation can affect how we perceive other people's faces. So they injected a group with a small bacterial toxin that produces a minor bacterial infection, and they found that people who had that infection actually found other people's faces much more threatening than people who don't have the infection. And this is very important because if people have low levels of, of inflammation, it may be affecting how you're interacting with your friends, your wife, your children, your neighbors, your work colleagues. And if yoga reduces that inflammation, does it change your social outlook on life? So these are the kinds of questions that are very interesting. So here's another study that uh, really, to me, I found almost unbelievable. They found, this was a Harvard study, they found that a small organ in the brain called the amygdala, which is sort of uh, involved in fear, it's involved in happiness. The size of the amygdala is related to the number of meaningful relationships that you have in your life. This is not a cause and effect relationship. Again, you should not mistake this to assume that the brain is necessarily causing that, but it might work the other way around. And if, by doing yoga, the size of your amygdala goes up, does that change your outlook? Does that change how you interact with people? Does that make you more likely to make friends? So these are kinds of interesting uh, uh, questions that neuroscience is trying to answer. So this, I'm going to conclude with this. This is a national survey 
of yoga practitioners that was done. I think there were probably about eight or 9,000 yoga teachers who took part in the survey, and they compared yoga practitioners versus non-yoga practitioners versus the general population. So not surprisingly, if you look at this graph, yoga practitioners led much more healthy lives. They were, much more, they were less likely to be smokers. They were more likely to be vegetarian. Um, they were less likely to be obese. Very interesting, yoga tr uh, practitioners were more likely to consume alcohol. So we're going to watch for that in the bar tonight. Um, and then if you look at the right side, which is what I think is critical, yoga practitioners compared to the U.S. national sample were much more likely to flourish, were much more likely to make meaningful relationships, and were much less likely to describe themselves as languishing. All of the similar things that uh, they found in the study that uh, was done at the, uh, that, that you heard in the previous talk by Alyssa. So this is my um, last slide. I think uh, Carolyn wanted me to finish a little early. So, uh, and I love this cartoon. So there's this woman going, I wonder if there is a yoga pill. <laughs> and unfortunately, unfortunately, no, there isn't, because I think it's the whole experience that matters. But if there was, it would be the best-selling pill in the world. And I think what I've tried to sort of give you a glimpse for is that the power of the mind, yoga is a tool to understand the power of the mind, can change the brain, and can, through changing the brain or as a correlate, can indeed change and socially transform the individual. So I think that's really an area that's uh, ripe for further study, and I'm going to stop at this point.